The goal is to enjoy every single moment of your life, not just find moments that you get to enjoy. And so for me, not only is that extraordinary discipline, but it's also highly adaptive in the same way. Where did you get that guy? Man, my wife got it for me, but you know, it, it's trying to find like the super legit, like hardcore, like, you know, carved from stone. Sure. Uh, Marcus statue was, uh, you know, a little, little bit more difficult than I had thought. There's so many different versions of them in different sizes, but I wanted one that was like substantial, you know. I, I have I have a substantial one that I can't reach. It's too heavy. But then I, I got this I got this little one. This is from the eighteen forties. Uh, oh really? Oh think, oh yeah. Yeah, it's I, amazing. I like to think about I like to think about who owned it before me, and how fucking dead they are. Oh, I mean, I, I'll tell you what. Like like when you say that, that makes me want to go and try to hunt down like the oldest possible one. I was looking at the coins, trying to get buy some of the coins with his head on them. Yeah. I have one of those somewhere. Oh. You know, that I will eventually buy. Yeah, yeah. Cause there's some of those are like 50 G's, like some like the like gold ones, right? Like Yeah. It it is crazy. Uh, this was definitely not fifty thousand. This was like a couple hundred bucks. But <clears throat> it's crazy to think like this guy was so famous in his own life that his face was on the money people carried around. And then he tried to be like a normal person, like imagine how corrupting it would be. I mean, you're, you're obviously very famous, but that would be a fra I mean, that's like a fraction of how much fame this guy must have had. No, I know. It's part of the fascination that I have with like the ability to distill life's truths down into words uh, that stand the test of time and impact me. 2000 years later where I got to I got to eventually like get a, a statue of this person because now I believe I can create work and impact that stays on the earth for thousands of years. That's that's what he means to me beyond beyond just the words, you know. But isn't it funny though he would he writes in meditations about how worthless posthumous fame is and how it's what he's he's not trying for it and yet he managed he managed to do it anyway. Try, like he, it's like he hit the target, even though he was deliberately trying not to let the target distract him. Right, right. Like he, he, because he knew for hit, the same way for me. When I think about having a five hundred year plan and impacting, you know, generations upon generations of deer decks. Like, I also know that it's just exciting for me to create like this giant multi-generational strategy I have, but I also yeah. know it could just die out in generation two and be completely over and I'm okay with that. I enjoy the process of thinking that it could go on for thousands of years, you know. But, and also if you're working on this big plan, this huge thing you're trying to build and you hate doing it now, but you're telling yourself it will be worth it because in the future people will enjoy it. I think you're 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 out of alignment, right? You have to be able to enjoy it now. And if I think if you do enjoy it now and you do it with purity and intention and love and you know presence and all of that, it actually makes it more likely that you'll make something that lasts and endures. Yeah, I mean, look, for me, you know, I I transitioned in 2020 from self-preservation to like generational preservation. And because you don't, you, you, you almost like, you have to grow your wealth to a certain level, right? Because I, I wasn't a writer. When you write your books, you know that these could last for thousands of years. You know, books are, books are sort of this medium that, that have life that go way beyond the author. Art has that same capacity. Um, you know, having a, sh uh, being a pro skateboarder and, you know, having a show of viral videos doesn't have the same uh, impact on the globe for thousands of years. Right. And once I began to evolve and really, really began to, to think a lot about the strategies that I've developed to lead like a very beautiful, peaceful, harmonious, amazing existence, 
it then began to connect me to, you know, how do you build things that last much longer? And then once I ge generated the wealth, I began to look at how I could actually make an impact multi-generationally, which then turned into like, man, you could make stuff that sits in the, the world forever. And that's what even attracted me to even finding a uh, really, you know, daily meditations and stoicism in the first place, because once I heard that, like, you know, meditations was written 150 years ago, and that like, it has stood the test of time, it, it proved to me it was possible to create something that had that lasting impact, you know? Well, I, I want to talk to you about two ways that your work has impacted my life. But first, I want to tell you a quick Mark Cerulli statue story before we move on from this. So have you ever been to Budapest? Okay, so you should go because Marcus Aurelius wrote a good chunk of meditations in Budapest, uh, in what, what the Roman camp of uh, of what was then called Aquincum. I'm probably mispronouncing, but you can go there. You could be in this little village where he wrote it. There's even like a hot springs that is available open to the public that like the Romans would have used. Like you're you're using the same spring coming up from the earth that like potentially Marcus Aurelius used. But anyways, in this museum at Aquincum they have a statue and it's a statue of the emperor. But what really struck me about it, seeing the sort of just the head of Marcus Aurelius behind it, what struck me about the statue is, it was a, a statue for what was the cult of the emperor. So the emperor is worshiped as a God in his own life. And the, they would pray to him and make sacrifices to him. But here's what's interesting about the statue. The statue is the, the body of the Roman male emperor and then the, it goes to the neck and then the head was replaceable, right? So, so each new emperor would come along and they would just carve a new head. They were like, why should we, it's hard to make a statue. Why should we do all this other work that nobody really cares about? All that matters is the face. And I loved, and I think Marcus would have appreciated the idea of like, we're just a placeholder. Like they're swapping us in and out and like as important and as well known as our face might be, as soon as our moment in the sun is done, somebody else comes along and replaces us. Yeah. Yeah. And think about the, the, the rapid rate of replacement, you know, because he lived pretty relatively old for the time, you know, compared to the average person. And really everybody was dying at like 40, you know. And so it's like this idea that, you know, we're in the, we're entering this age of where, uh, you know, people are starting to live went from 40 to 80 in 100 years. And, and we're on the cusp of of curing the disease that is aging that people could be, you know, living to 150 200 years, you know. Yeah, well, there was there was a year before uh, se several generations before Marcus. And it's called the year of five emperors. So they had five in one year, like they just kept dying or being killed. And, and so the idea is, yeah, we're none of this is as stable and none of us are as permanent as we'd like to think we are. Yeah. Well, look, I, I told you this when we met at Tom Billy's house, uh, you're obviously it was a silly TV show, but I, I feel like I partly live in the country and have donkeys and animals because you had a reality show on MTV when I was in college and you're like, fuck it, I'm going to get a horse. And I was like, you can just do that. <laughs> so, so you never know the kind of impact you can have on a person. Yeah. Listen to me. A lot of people went out and bought mini horses after Robin big and every single one of them regretted it because a mini <laughs> horse is not, look, you think like the same way that I thought I was purchasing a dog, like, ah, it's just a dog with, that's a little less maneuverable. It's full fledged livestock. And I could not wait till the, to, to when we ended, um, robbing big to get rid of that horse you know what i mean it, it couldn't have happened too soon because that was a mean piece of livestock as opposed to a sweet little pony you know what i mean well i i don't have horses because i i had heard that about horses and that donkeys are friendly and and uh I, I have a little bit more space than i think you did in the hollywood hills but is the horse still around yeah you know i i'm Cause they live forever yeah i think he lives in burbank right now you know uh <laughs> We, you know, when we shot the last season of Fantasy Factory, we did sort of a, we got, we did an episode, we wrote an episode where 
we didn't get a Hollywood star. We got a Studio City Square, right? Mm -hmm. And in Studio City, we got a like this black square with Robin Big on on the sidewalk. So we brought the mini horse out and mm -hmm. dressed up like we were we were all Robin Big from the same clothes from the Robin Big era um, to to go through the process of getting our square in Studio City instead of our star in Hollywood. And that was the last time I've seen the horse. So I don't know. I don't know. So well, I, th this also was, I think, probably not the lesson one might expect to take from that show, which I, I, I genuinely loved. Um, I remember, so the, the concept of the show, for people who aren't familiar, is you're a skateboarder, you get yourself into trouble, you go in places you're not, so you hire this guy to be your security guard slash body man to follow you around and help you, and uh, you guys become friends. It's this hilarious show. But I remember looking at that and it expand like, what I took from that was like skateboarding for you is your job, your body and your ability to practice that thing is your livelihood. And if hiring a person to follow you around and be your bodyguard makes you better at that job, that's a good investment. And so I think people struggle, whether they're a writer or an entrepreneur, or they have some job that people make fun of like social media influencer or whatever they don't like we struggle with like hey like if you if you made widgets and you had to buy a van to deliver your vid your widgets or a factory to make the widgets and you'd be like that's the cost of doing business but i think for other businesses we struggle to like invest in ourselves or spend on the things that will help us do that thing more and that was weirdly a lesson i took from that show Listen to me, that's a stretch of a lesson from a concept of like where I wrote the concept for a skate video because I did not think my skateboarding was going to be the, of the quality to showcase uh, compared to the other pros. So I wrote a funny skit of, hey, when we go to like skate places in the street, security guards kick us out, but now they can talk to my security guard. I right. could have never thought in a million years that that would have turned into a television show. Right. Uh, but, but I maximized sort of the opportunity and it discovered an entirely new way for me to create to, to create uh, both content and revenue and understand how to use media platforms to monetize them, which then scaled into uh, Fantasy Factory, which was a show of just monetizing brand partnerships. And then, you know, Ridiculousness, which was ultimately an annuity uh, to that that became you know, multiple businesses off of that. But, you know, I think what it what it is, as opposed to a resource as an entrepreneur, um, it is this idea of like, you can be very creative and opportunity can present itself by creating something that goes viral in a small community. And then you scale that to a bigger world, it opens up a lot of different opportunities for you. you know? Well, yeah. And it's also, I found in my life that whenever I'm like, you know, it would be crazy. What if I did X, right? Like, what if I did X? Um, you're not normally supposed to do X, but I found that when I do it, it opens up like, like my wife and I were sitting at the, the, the cafe across the street. And she was like, you know, it'd be crazy. What if we bought that building and turned it into a bookstore? And I was like, yeah, we should, you know? And I think most of the time when people hear crazy ideas, they, they like to entertain it, but they won't actually do it. And to a certain degree, that's kind of your brand is like you take the fantasy or the wouldn't it be crazy if and then you actually you, you, you make it real. Yeah. And look, I, I think it's you know, I think the difference with sort of how I've evolved is you know, when you look at the bookstore and you look at, hey, we should turn that into a bookstore. Well, that that's that is an, a lot more complex than just, um, yeah, let's do it, honey, because the reality of it is, is like now you have to understand, well, do we have the time to do that? How much will it cost? Like, what about collecting all those books and the people? Do we understand how to hire the people to operate it? And what do we what do we do if the income slows down? And then like there's all this complexities and then you have to answer that towards well, is this what I want to take on in life? You know, a lot of times, you know, you would take that on and you would be lost in the idea of, of how cool it would be and never take into the first and second order consequences of what it will do to your energy and your time, your money and your soul to actually execute that. And, and I think that that's the, 
the growth for me o- over the last you know many years was ultimately I used to say I, I had the ability to do anything, so I did everything, but I stood for nothing. And ultimately, I just wasn't happy, you know. And when I really started looking at everything with this um, sort of holistic approach of like, I want to design a life that I live, and how does this play a part in my overall life, and how I'm spending my time, and how that time is delivering energy for me, and ultimately, what it, what am I? What is my mind thinking about in all of this? Am I enjoying the process of life? And then began to put all these big ideas through that filter. Then I began to grow bigger and bigger things with less and less effort that led me to a more harmonious, high quality existence rather than just like the next bright, shiny object that I would sure. chase. Everything has purpose compared to what I what I was like back then, you know? Yeah. One of the things I'm on guard with is like, so I get into what I get into because I love writing. That's what I love doing. And then if you're successful at that thing, you get a lot of opportunities and requests to do not that thing, right? Hey, do you want to come talk here? Hey, do you want to consult on this? Hey, do you want to write my book for me instead of one of your books? You basically get these ancillary or adjacent opportunities that that can be more lucrative than the thing that you love but they leave very little time for the thing that you love. So how I'm curious, as you've gone on, you've explored all these different things, how is that, how has that changed your relationship with the thing you've been doing since you were like a tiny kid, the actual pleasure and presence and obsession with like just messing around with this piece of wood with wheels on it? Yeah. I mean, look, it's not even a part of my life. You know what I mean? Really? I don't even like, um, it's not, it, it was something that I enjoyed and loved to do, but my passion has always been creating, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I started my first company at 16 years old. And, and so it's like my, my actual, you know, sort of like drive to create different things is what's actually at the core, you know what I mean? And, and to me, it's, you know, when you think about like you have this access, you wrote, wrote these books. Now people want you to do all these things. It's sort of your time and energy. And for me, I ended up deciding I would never compromise that ever again. And OK, well, how can I do that? Well, first of all, I need a certain amount of money. Right. For me, I needed to earn two hundred million dollars and I have one hundred million dollars invested that generated five to seven million in, in passive income. So I had to get to there first because you're the first thing that you do is you make decisions based off of that money. Well, what would you do if money was never an object? So that was sort of my first target. And then I began to master time. I began to track and 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 uh, plan out all of the rhythms of my life, like your holidays and birthdays and, and everything to do with your life is in this rhythm. So I, I began to design my time and get better and better at designing my time around what gave me energy and I would use qualitative data. How do I feel about my life, work and health every day, zero to 10 to give me insights to, to what I needed to make changes on so that I could lead to a more probable higher energy future. And I just did that as a process on an ongoing basis where today I live every moment of the day in a very high level of energy, energy and joy by design. And then I have nothing pulling me towards dwelling or pushing me towards worrying. So I get to live in the ultra present basically all of my life. And the only time I drift out of the ultra present is when I'm creating a better future, which gives me the dopamine, which is exciting, or I'm rectifying something that has happened in the past because life comes at you. But for the most part, I've defended all aspects of my time and energy through a series of systematic evolution that allows me to live in a place of happiness every day. How much of your day do you feel like is is yours and how or are you one of those people where like every minute is like, you know, when you talk to someone, they're like, yeah, I can talk uh, tomorrow between 1107 and 1113 a.m. Are you one of those people or are you more of like a a white space? Uh, I take it where it leads me, guys. Depending on what it is, right? Because you got to think the moment you take on a new project, I can, you can see it in the second and third order consequences of your time. So you got to be incredibly careful. And I, 
to me, the key to happiness is perpetually evolving into your limitless potential. But if you don't have the time to actually reflect and, and like actually think about what you're learning as you're going and be able to uh, take that evolution and apply it to some sort of action, it's, it serves no purpose in you. And so for me, I am incredibly flexible on my time usage, depending on how I feel and what I feel like doing. So I will, you know, I'm working on a software, a book and, and a philosophy for two and a half years now. And I paid the author a half a million dollars. I've paid a few million dollars to the development team to work on the software. I'm, I have the entire team that I'm just spent paying on an ongoing basis to just ideate because I have no pressure to when I need to get it done, but I only work about 25% of my time because I spend the majority of time with my wife and kids or working on my health, right? So mm -hmm. like you use your money to buy your time and then you stay incredibly flexible based off of how you feel because the goal is to enjoy every single moment of your life, not just find moments that you get to enjoy. And so for me, not only is that extraordinary discipline, but it's also highly adaptive in the same way. You know? Well, yeah, I'm always surprised people are like, I'm doing this for my family. Like, that's why I work so hard. And then you're like, but how often do you see that family? And they're like, well, I'm gone you know, 250 days a year or something. And you're like, that doesn't sound like a rich life if you, you've you sold your time to someone else. But again, it's when you don't design all aspects of your existence and put some sort of quantifiable measurement against why you're doing it all that leads to where you're living in your ideal energy state. And for the most part, we, and this is how I used to be when I was younger. I thought if I did another television show, if I did another company, if I just made the money, that would be, then I could be happy and balanced, you know? Yeah. But instead, I started at zero and then built a balanced, harmonious existence and then grew beyond wealth, beyond my wildest dreams that transitioned me into a multi-generational thinker. And, and I did all of that in this beautiful, peaceful, harmonious way, because as I grew and evolved, I got better and better at life. I got better and better at being balanced. I got better and better at my use of time. And then I'm just in this continual state of evolution and growth on all aspects of my life, but never sacrificing anything ever. And keep yeah, in mind this, keep in mind this. I shoot 336 episodes of television a year. It is 4% of my time. I have taken that production and automated it and optimized it to where I can shoot eight episodes of television in five hours and shoot four times a month for 10 months a year. And, and, but the output of the ROI of that is, you know, like dollar for minute is, is so extraordinary, but, but that's only because you have been someone who's meticulously learned how to master your time, energy, and mind share through continuous, like development of systems and automation and optimization of those systems, you know? No, I totally agree. I mean, the Stoics talk about this. Seneca talks about how, you know, he's like, life isn't short. We just waste a lot of it. And I think a lot of people work a lot. They just work very, very inefficiently. And they, they congratulate themselves for the grind, you know, the 20 hour days or the, you know, 100 hour weeks. And then you're like, yeah, but there's only like 20% of that that moved the needle in any way. The rest was fat that you could have cut or conversations that you didn't want to have or boundaries you didn't want to draw, you could have you could have done that better. Yeah, and look, and and think about this, you know, like if if Marcus is, you know, the things that you think about determine the quality of your mind, right? Yeah. So even even if you are um trying to find work life balance and you're trying to work less, it's like if your mind is constantly being pulled back to dwelling in the past or worrying about the future, like your mind, uh, your mind share can be equally as damaging, regardless of how healthy you are and, and how you try to spend more time with your family. If you're constantly being pulled by all of these forces and you, you don't find harmony in your existence, 
Like you're, you're never going to find that piece. And to me, you have to design it and you have to get better and better at it, right? Like if we know mastery is this extraordinarily important aspect of, 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 of having a high quality life, well, look, you got to master you. And, and if, if, if that's one of the core tenets of stoicism, it's like, all right, well, how do you do that in the modern world? Well, you've got to understand what money means to you and master money. You've got to understand what time means to you and master time. You've got to understand what gives and takes energy and builds your life around that. You have to learn to master your existence because the better you get at, at mastering your existence, the easier life becomes because with mastery comes ease of operation. You know, you know, you have to be disciplined to be great at anything, but discipline is the beginning. When you're disciplined, it takes so much energy. Then it turns to habits. Habits take so much energy. When it finally turns to an, a way of life and intuitively who you are, where it's now how you subconsciously act, that's when you are living in a more masterful state where life and discipline and habits are easy because you no longer think about them. You know. Yeah, I mean, T Tim Ferriss sort of popularized this phrase, but you keep using the word, so I assume you agree. He talks about this idea of lifestyle design. Like if you're not gonna figure out what you want your life to look like, and I think more specifically, what you want your days to look like because your life is made up of days, then you're just winging it. And you're really at the mercy of like what other people say, what other people do, your moods, uh, you know, the weather. Um, you've got to come up with a plan, a system and then you repeat that plan and system, there's flexibility within it, but you're not just like, ah, what should I do today? That's it. And, 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 but you got to think about it. It's like quarter it's, it's, it's mornings to, to days, to weeks, to months, to quarters, to years. You, and yeah. it's always in this rhythm. And guess what? You are changing every day and the world is changing around you. So it's like, you have to develop the skill to perpetually evolve and guide your evolution because that's where self-mastery exists. You don't just all of a sudden get there. It's not like shooting pool or some other more binary skill that you can master. Like once you get really good at it, that's that. It's like the world is evolving and you're evolving. So you, and you're changing. You have kids, like what you used to enjoy to do. Like I used to enjoy to skateboard. I skateboarding to the demise of my six-year-old who called me a quitter yesterday. Day. He's like, you quit skateboarding. I said, son, I was a pro for 20 years uh, <laughs> and I retired. Uh, but you just continually evolve and change in your wants and needs. And, and I can say that who I am as a person changed as my success scale, right? Like I, when, when you can, when you evolve to a place where you literally like can do whatever you want, right? Like it, it makes you really begin to understand the choices that you will, the things you will say yes to and no to, um, because you, you really have the true flexibility in making that decision. And, and that in itself becomes this new, um, skill to develop and look at, because then you have to, to, to think about everything you do through the lens of what what long-term impact does it have on my time and energy? And then sometimes some things you work on for years. In my case, you know, I've been designing a house for 10 years. I've been, uh, you know, working on multiple different ongoing projects for years that I allow to overlap Why, uh, while I continue uh, to build and launch businesses on an ongoing basis, still shoot television and continue to develop my philosophy and shoot the other things. These are all these things that I enjoy that are both short term and long term and sort of understanding the life and legacy I want to create long term. And then bang, right down in the middle. I don't ever sacrifice my energy or my time to do anything as it relates to being balanced and happy and spending time with my family and picking my kids up at school and dropping my kids off and taking them to karate and taking my wife to, to date nights and movie nights and breakfast dates and Thursday night talk nights and Wednesday night movie night tonight. You know, it's like I built all of this into a rhythm that my family can, feels this balance and this energy of what's possible. And I want to be an archetype to people of this is how you live a harmonious existence, not and be hyper successful rather than 
trying to find work-life balance and being ultra successful. And then like, oh, now I got to spend, now, now I should go on vacation. You know what I mean? Type of vibe. Well, like a life is made up of days. A day is made up of chunks. I think the morning being the most essential chunk of the day. Like, I feel like if you get the morning right, a pretty good day inevitably follows. What, do, what does morning look like for you? What's, a, what's your morning routine? Well, look, my mornings are, are, are dependent, you know, on if I get up at 3.30 or I get up at 4.30. Um, you know, a lot of times, like luckily for me, my wife started uh, doing like 5 a.m. calls uh, for her business. So she started wanting to go to bed earlier. I need about seven hours of sleep. So if we get to bed at like 8.30 or 9, I'm getting up at 3.30 or 4. Um, and then I start my day by sending her an email of every single thing that I'm doing that day. Um, and that's generated from my chief of staff. And then I put a love quote on it so that she has insight to everything that I'm doing um, in that day. I have my coffee pre-made uh, the night before. So it's brewing when I get up. I uh, take a eight ounce shot of salt water and do five minutes of red light therapy before uh, I head downstairs and have my first cup of coffee. Um, before I send her, then I send her that email. And then I go through all my time from the day before and, and fill out how my day looked uh, to track all my time. Because I basically, I fill out all my time in the calendar that, that was blank and it all has tags that pump into a dashboard that shows me where I use all my time. Then I, I go back to my daily data where every day I track, did I brain train? Did I meditate? Did I get up before five? Did I get in the gym? Did I eat clean? Meaning I had uh, no sugar, no carbs, no uh, nothing but lean meat and vegetables. And did I not drink? And did I take my supplements? Those are what I track each day. Um, and then I go through and, and fill out all of that. Then I fill out, how do I feel zero to 10? about my life, work, and health um, that basically make up the data set that I have for years, right? Of yeah. Years of collecting this data. So I could show you how, and I, and I sent it to you. Uh, I yeah, think you I sent me your, your yeah. discipline spreadsheet. It was but amazing. it's the, what, what that, all that stuff pulls out of my calendar into these dashboards. So I've gamified my discipline. I know that last month I did all of that 100%. You know what I mean? Like, I know that I, there's not a, a, ever a day off for me as to me, every day is amazing. And that process is part of that, that sort of day. But then I brain train and then I qualitatively rate the brain training to see how my mind feels each day. Then I meditate on a manifestation meditation. Um, and then I wake my kids up. Uh, take my kids to school and then meet the trainer at the house at 745. That's how basically every day for me starts. Wow. Do you, do you, uh, I guess that all that data and all that writing is kind of a form of journaling. You're creating, you know, messages to yourself based on what you did, but do you have a, do you have a journaling practice also, or is this mostly what you just sort of do in your head? Yeah. You look, I, I'm, my journaling practice is, 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 is through the lens of milestones, right? Like I, I'm in this sort of rapid state of evolution and, and in this continual um, sort of place of learning and growing and shifting. So I do my five and 10 year uh, or a five and 15 year uh, planning every quarter. And then I update those documents on an ongoing basis. And then I collect milestones of major thoughts and major things that are going on. Um, that are that are connected to it because the beauty of it when you look at it all when you layer it over top you see how like the hot the happier i am the how much more wealthier i am you see how much more disciplined i am you just see how like and when you layer the blood work on top of that when you when you look at all the the, the sets of data that i could lay over top of that sort of core growth of evolution and discipline, when you see it all together, the, the most profound aspect of it is that when I started doing qualitative data, asking myself about my life, how I felt zero to 10 about my life, health and work, the numbers were in 12s and 13s where today they're at 23s. And it's like you, you really can see in all of these numbers how, how much truly happier you are 
I could show you in the numbers that I went from, you know, working 36% of my time down to 26% of my time. Like I, and, and as you master time, you time slows down and then you understand the value of time so deeply that you're so precious with it. And then here's one of the greatest assets of mastering time. There is no point in my life that I look at my kids and wonder where the time went. There is no point in my life where I ever contemplate the idea of where did the time go? Because I know exactly where all of it has gone and I created, designed and optimized it with the intent to enjoy it and experiencing it. And so I feel each and every year of my life as what another extraordinary year in the human experience. And I can't wait to continue to, to see what the future holds because as tight as I plan it, I continue to evolve and change on such a level and, and, and the universe continues to conspire to bring more opportunities and more interesting things that fit inside the parameter of my willingness to dedicate the time to these things that, that allow me to continually live this very exciting, rewarding, fulfilling life. And what do I wanna do? I want to live 1 million hours. That's 114 years and 54 days. You know what I mean? Like, and so I, I, I know that I got 8,760 a year and that if I do something for one hour a day, that it's 4% of my life. So watching TV for one hour a day with my wife, I know, boy, that's a, if I, if I watch two hours of TV, that's 8% of my life. It's, it's so much more significant when you think about shooting 336 episodes of television, it's only 4% of your life. And, and really the value of your time, when you understand it more intuitively, you just use it in a much different way. You know? No, I, I, I do a, a slightly less, uh, slightly, much, much, much scaled down version of what you do. Part of my journaling practice, I use this little journal. It's called One Line a Day. And uh, this, this is my one from 2017 to 2000, I guess, 21. It's, there's one line per day. So, But I, I think what, what I'm picking up that I think is valuable in what you're talking about in time management, you can't manage your time in the abstract or journal in the, in, in, in the sort of generalities. You have to have marks that you're measuring against. You have to be, where was I last year? Where was I the year before? What was I doing? you know, at last December, you, you, by, by tracking what you're doing, you're able to see how you're doing relative to that point, whether you're doing the same things that you should be doing, whether you're stuck in the same holes, whether you're plateaued in some way, you, you have to be able to, you, you can't just be, hey, I write some stuff down every day. I think ideally you have a system or a, a flow that allows you to check where you are are going relative to where you have been recently and not so recently. Right. And look, it's no different than investing in stocks and watching your stock portfolio. Sure. And like, you know, it, it's like these quantified things that we apply on these simple to easy to understand things we're okay with, but trying to figure out a way to quantify our happiness and our joy and our overall quality of life has been abstract and there's no framework for it. Right. And, and I think once I really developed that framework personally and then began to visualize it and use it, I, I, I could now like gather the insights that I needed to make the change that were all leading to a better life. But, but I digress towards this idea that um, I just think journaling is a, a, a something I'm not doing that would be extraordinarily valuable for the reflective side of like my existence, right? Like I, I, it's like, it's almost like it took me so many years before I discovered meditation. It, this conversation today is going to like make me, um, has unlocked for me. It's like, man, just write, add into your world of just writing down one thing, right? Because yeah. one thing that me and my wife do as a, as a, as an exercise is each week we write down what we want to celebrate that week. And then we mm -hmm. read them at the end of every year. And man, it is, you forget, you forget stuff that was awesome and you take it for granted. 
it, that's, but it's, it's like just even that exercise where it's, it, since it's, what do you want to celebrate this week? It's like going back and looking at the wins. And, and it's really funny when you celebrate something that ends up like not being what you expected or, or, you know, it's, it's, or it never even happened. You know what I mean? Like it, sure. it's so fascinating, but now, well, now that we've done this all these years and, and then we, we put them in a wine bottle, shake them out at the end of the year. Like, but then I give them to the chief of staff and now I have this like list of all of them from all the years, which ends up creating this written body of work that's representative of our lives and that moment in time. And that's that power of journaling that gives you insight to your mind that for me, in this, just sitting here talking to you, just, it just hit me like the hardest ton of bricks ever where I'm like, man, you have got to like, how many more times do you got to hear the word journal before you start doing it? Cause I, I feel like when I originally journaled, I would write these comprehensive, like, 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 you know, 30 minute long writing out all of these things that would just take up too much time and energy. And you have changed my life here today because it's going to be just one line and I'm going to do it every single day from this point forward for the rest of my life. I want you to know that. I love that. I love that. Well, uh, I think you already are journaling in just a different form, but I think you would like this. And even if you guys well, we're just collecting the, the the gratitude thing you're doing with your wife. I think that would be awesome too. Well, is, okay. So speaking of reflecting on stuff, here's something I'm curious about. So you have this goal, you have this idea that you have to get to a certain amount of wealth with a certain amount of passive income that will free you up to do stuff. I think we often, we have these goals. Like I'll talk to people, they have a number. They're like, my number is X. I am always really curious what it feels like when they get to that number. So what was that experience like for you? Was it amazing? Was it anticlimactic? Did you learn something? Look, it's, you change as a person. You change as a human being. Cause you got to think about this. My goal, I needed to earn $200 million, which is so out, like for most people, even from like, for me, it was like, it's ambitious. It's an incomprehensible number. Yeah, it's in, in for, for, for most people, it's, it, it's insane. Now for me, I did in a self-assessment of like, what does money mean to me? Well, money's my lifestyle. What is my lifestyle? Well, I know that I'm probably going to want to spend between two and $3 million a year. Right. So that's, that's what I started first with first, which is a lot of money. Right. And so it's like, now I'm being realistic with that's who I am. And that's sort of the identity. Then I began to look at asset classes. Well, okay. Well, how, what, what would, what would I need to do to generate that in a passive way, but still grow it? Then I discovered a uh, multifamily syndication, right? So now I'm like, okay, you, you put for every million dollars, you get seven to 10% and fully tax depreciated cash. Um, that is basically tax free. And then that would be my goal right now. If I get to, um, you know, a hundred million dollars that I'm going to have 7 million, even if, even if my, uh, that gives me the ability to, to scale up to, uh, the bigger lifestyle, but I should never need more than that, you know, whatever it is. And so initially I, I wanted to build a house for 35 million. I wanted to keep 15 million in cash at all times to keep my expenses at 3 million. And I wanted 50 million in real estate. Okay. And that would kick off, you know, the, the 7% that would, sure. would cover everything. And then if something were to happen, I had the cash sitting there and man, it's like when you have a hundred thousand dollars invested in when your goal is, uh, getting to 50 million, yeah. it feels good. Because it's like, it wasn't like when I got to 800,000, when I got to 1.2 million, when I got to 20 million, I was like, man, I could, I'm kind of set for life right now. Yeah. Uh, when I got to 50 million, it was like, I can't believe I made it when I'm, I'm just at the edge of a hundred million. And I'm like, I feel like a completely different human being. Because it's one thing to have this. And now to give you an idea, I have a blended passive income and strategy that includes high yield savings account, um, uh, ETF dividend stocks to, and a, a bonds portfolio. Right. And sure. so this together creates this very low, uh, you know, single digit tax 
um, liability. And then this this growth and security that's related to real estate investments and bonds and 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 uh, index type funds. What? What? But I still made a hundred million dollars last year in normal income. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's like yeah. forget about because I had no pressure that I had grown to that level. That so even when I make that level of money and pay an exorbitant amount of taxes on that, I still don't, I'm not changing the way that I live. I'm not necessarily doing anything like extraordinary. I, I am just like growing and operating the plan that I created. You know what I'm saying? And then it freed up my mind to be able to create opportunities that created much larger scale than I could have ever imagined. But I did all of that with never sacrificing my time. You know what I mean? Or my energy, right? In, in the sense of like what, what the type of world that I created and why. So, so I go back to this idea, even for someone like you, is you have to have that same financial strategy and where you're headed and why. Because what's actually on the other side of it is this incredible feeling of security and peace. Right. And, and, you know, we talk about financial freedom, but it's financial harmony that I have where like I understood why I wanted money. I understood where I wanted to put it and what its purpose was. And then I understood how my strategies on how I was going to make it, but I was not going to sacrifice my time and energy. So when I built companies, I did not uh, operate these companies. I would uh, co-find them, create them, um, finance them and bring them to market and grow them and, and then have other people operate them. So I built the entire system and strategy and then was able to realize it, but it was all built around what was the ideal version of my life. Right. And when you reach sure. that level, like you change as a person, you, you, that's why I transitioned from self-preservation to generational preservation and began to look at like, man, I'm going to build a family bank structure that I'm going to give access and opportunity to Deerdex for thousands of years. I'm going, you know, it's like, it changed me as a person, but it gave me that much more clarity and that much more desire to be more disciplined and, and experience life on an even higher level, right? Like that's the, that's the other side of it. You would think that would have, there's no rest in that because I evolved here and I, I can see how much further I can grow. And I just want to keep getting better and better at life because that's actually what I enjoy doing the most, you know? So multifamily syndication, that's like uh, real estate deals, basically people coming in doing like what, like hard money stuff or yeah, so, so basically what you would do is you, it's a LP and GP structure, but you're in a single LLC. So you own the building. So you get the depreciation yeah. and then you 1031 exchange it when you sell it, mm. but you give up, you know, 20% of the profits to the, the general partner who's an expert at operating the business or the building. Yeah. So if you put in 10 million, now you get, you know, 700,000 in tax-free cash a year for that 10 million. Then when that in five, 10 years, they sell uh, the building and now your 10 million in equity is worth uh, 20 million. Instead of paying taxes on that, you roll that into your next building. And now your basis for your 7% of cash is now 20 million instead of 10 million, but you don't, it takes no energy. And, sure. and, you know, another great book and the richest man in Babylon, you're putting your money with like masters of this type of investment class that have 30 year track histories of never losing principal and, and 18% IRRs through the 2008, uh, you know, collapse of real estate cycle. You're even looking at it through that lens so that you're even uh, making the decision on where you deploy capital with, with mastery rather than just one of your homies that wants to buy a building. You know what I mean? Sure. Sure. No, I do. I, I think that stuff's really interesting. And I've done some of it myself. I think some people, particularly like artistic types or whatever, they, they, they have like an aversion to thinking that way because it feels dirty or it feels complicated. It feels like a distraction. But I think you, ideally you get to a place where you have enough skill, you have enough understanding with how to sort of 
save money, invest money, grow it passively, that then you're freer in your business life to do, you know, if you want to do X, but nobody wants to fund it, you can fund it yourself. If you, if you want to do the more artistically pure version of something uh, and you know it's not going to sell as much, you're like, I don't care. I'm not doing this for money. My money comes from over here. It's like you're creating, in a sense, like a trust fund for yourself, right? It's like your parents didn't give it to you. You earned it over here with this different side of your brain. And like when I, when I went to write my first book about Stoic philosophy, uh, my publisher was not like, that sounds like a, a real moneymaker, right? Like I was able to take less money. Uh, I was able to let that book grow slowly over time because investments I'd made in real estate, because of jobs I'd taken, savings I had, I had like financial freedom isn't this thing that means you don't have to work anymore. I think what it means is you get to make pure and better work decisions because you're not thinking only in terms of maximizing income. But forget about making pure and better work decisions. Think about your mind. It gives you it's so much back to your mind because it's never something that that's one of the heaviest things that steals mind share in sure. between working on what you love is the stress of finances and not understanding it and where are we going? Should I do this? Because a lot of times I get offered stuff all the time that it's ex like insane amount of money that I don't. It's not even like a question of whether or not I would do it. Absolutely not. It's not worth the yeah. time. I don't care what it is. I don't need more fame. Like I don't need like I, when I did this last television deal like i'm like if it didn't take such little amount if i hadn't optimized this thing to where i could shoot that much television in yeah. that little of time i wouldn't do it right like it's sure. but but when i when i step back and look at like what i what what that level of money can provide uh for for the long term and that they're they're willing to continue to pay it to me for a very long period of time and i've just continued to optimize shooting it so it takes very little energy it's it's adding to my longer vision of like how do i continue to make impact um beyond myself um but without the effort and and but but it's mind share over everything that that's the thing that i i I, and, and here's the thing about it. When it, it doesn't have to be complex like mine is. Yeah. You could just straight up and down, I'm going to spend, you know, 50 grand a year. And my goal is to put like make 150 and put 50 away in an index fund that, that doubles every seven or eight years. And then when I get to 1.5 million, I now have, you know, enough money to live on forever. And yeah. That you then when you get a deal that's going to make you 400, then you're like, perfect, I'll stay at 50. And then I'm going to put in 200. And now instead of it being 15 years from now, it's now going to be six years. But nobody thinks of money through that lens of like, it's it, it is it is both security, mind share, and your 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 way of being that what would you do if money was not an object, like is is something that most people don't you ever ever have in their lifetime as as an option because it's it's it, it takes a certain amount of discipline and i quit high school at 17 you know what i mean i wasn't educated and don't understand money i was a creative entrepreneur and i built company after company after company that that came and went and i made millions and lost millions because i never understood money i didn't even learn money till i was 40 I'm 48 years old. At 42, I had $600,000 in in the strategy. You know what I mean? By by like in a short amount of time I had reached that goal because I had built built the strategy to do it, but I didn't build this over over 20 years. I learned all of this in the last 6 or 7 years, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, it's it, the, the number doesn't have to be and almost uh, for for almost everyone listening should not be anywhere in the ballpark of 200 million. It could be a retirement account of 200,000, but you're 26 years old or 28 years old. And you know that if you just keep doing what you're doing, that's going to get you somewhere uh, where you want to go. I think the trouble is we tell ourselves, hey, if I get to X, if I do this, 
I won't have to think about money anymore. And then the mind, it, you have to have a certain amount of discipline to go, I don't need to think about this, right? Like a lot of people, my friend uh, Ramit Sehi, Sethi talks about this quite a bit. Um, we have this problem where we go, hey, uh, I'm earning a lot, I'm saving a lot, um, now I have a lot, and I'm still sweating whether I can upgrade my drink at Starbucks. You, like we're, we're, we have trouble uh, being too, uh, a lot of people have uh, trouble the, the discipline that made them successful, made them good at money, they have trouble turning off when they should not have to sweat a $3 decision, as he says. You should be, fo he's saying, focus on the $30,000 decision, right? You go, to, you go to your job every day and you, you're not uh, maximizing your earning potential and then you're kicking yourself that you could have got gas 15 cents cheaper down the road. You're not looking at the variable that really moves the needle for you. But again, like when you think about that, that there's so many things that are pulling. There's so many yeah. things that are pulling, like because you're you're already in a bad place of being unbalanced or 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 operating from a face place of fear. If you even think like that, because, again, think about what that is when it's dwelling, you know, where your mind shifts down to dwelling, it's pulling energy out of you. You know what I'm saying? It yeah. pushes up into worrying, like where you have to live in this state of, of rectifying the past being future, future past or future present or present in order to be in this higher energetic state. And that's different people's makeups is their relationship with money. And at the end of the day, you just want financial harmony. You just want it. You want to be feel good about money and under. You need to learn it and understand it. Anxiety comes from when you just don't understand it and don't have a plan. And your only um, thing that you understand is how to have a job and hope you keep that job and and pay for your expenses. But then then you you don't take care of yourself. You have bad relationships. Like you have trauma. You now you're you. You, you have low energy and you got to lose yourself in alcohol and watching Netflix and then you're back in the job again and then you wish you had a different job, but you, you're only hoping and wishing because you're, you, you don't have the energy to ever create a better future for yourself. Like you get trapped in your system. Then those, you know, we all are creating systems on an ongoing basis. It's not just about creating good systems that lead you to better habits. We intuitively drive everything into a systematic way of being it in order to make it easier for us to operate and some people's systems are literally like being at the job hating the job wanting to get to their friends getting alcohol eating a pizza watching it like netflix for two hours regretting staying up two hours late being tired at work again sleeping like going to bed early oversleeping then meeting a friend like your system is built to keep you in this perpetual state of anxiety and and lack of clarity and then you have moments and you're like i'm gonna i'm gonna motivate myself and do it now but your system and your subconscious has been built in a way where you can only muster up a little bit of motivation you snap right back into your your same triggers and your same rhythms you know i like to say like you know, you can't change one part of your life without changing it all the same way that you can't design one part of your life without designing it all because you are a fully integrated multi-dimensional being that is made up of a series of systems that that create your existence that integrate into the world around you. And if you don't look at it like that, you're just going to be continually like trying to create pockets of happiness or pockets of success rather than be a successful human being. Well, we, we started this marveling at how the Stoics had talked about this same stuff 2,000 years ago. I think it's pretty amazing, given what you're just saying. One of my favorite quotes from Seneca, he says, life without design is erratic, right? If you don't have a design, if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a system, you're just winging it. And you don't do a good job winging it when you're tired, when you're overworked, when you're distracted, when there's addictive substances and apps and things out there like you got to create a system and you got to be able to step back and see that from a distance so you can you can as you're saying see things in generational terms as opposed to just me immediate terms you got to get that perspective and i think that's what the, journaling does what reading does what great podcasts do is they allow you to step back see it from a distance make a plan and then not be jerked around by every impulse or instinct yeah.
Yeah, I think hey, that's another thing that I, I love so much about like, you know, from Marcus's a point of like having so much, but this idea of being disciplined against all that you have access to and you could actually yeah. do is, is a much more uh, better way of living. You know what I mean? And, and, and it's this idea of even for him still knowing that like, you're still trying to like not let you're trying to get to a place where nothing affects you and that you're the one living with the joyful heart, you know, holy living with a you know, joyful heart. Like you're, it's like, don't let these outside forces like end up uh, affecting your joy and your well being. but you have to design your life in a way that you begin to grow away from the interdependency of these outside forces and eliminate the ones that actually, uh, you know, disrupt you and actually sway the way that you live. And you have to do that through some sort of process or understanding. And that's what the qualitative data did for me, you know, by just asking myself how I felt about these parts of my life, you begin to see the, the things that you must change. And over time, I built defenses around my existence that today I have very little interdependencies that could ever actually disrupt my energy. And it is why I spend you know, the majority of my life in a place of, of joy and rarely ever even have a negative thought because I just simply don't have anything negative to think about. Dude, I, I love this so much. And uh, like I said, your show is actually a very big influence on me in a, in a bunch of good ways. And uh, I'm so glad we got to meet and uh, hope to see you in person again one of these days. No doubt. Thanks for having me on.